as an uh, experimentalist observer, this is my favorite kind of session. It's the experimental session, where we uh, try to do something that we have not actually ever seen um, performed in real life before. And the, uh, the idea is that while we've been mostly uh, in separate uh, you know, silos of our life sciences, mathematics, and, uh, and uh, fundamental physics up till now, the idea was to try to do a session where we could see what would happen if we actually talk to each other. And, <laughs> And in, in particular, we, we were uh, curious uh, to see um, wh whether we could learn something uh, about a little bit of the, um, you know, how the different fields are, are uh, choosing their problems and, and their tools and approaches, and what looks, what looks familiar and what looks different from the perspectives of each other. And so the, uh, the approach that we're going to take today is having a round robin of three presentations from uh, one of each of the, uh, of the Breakthrough Prize field uh, speakers, and, uh, and then the other two um, members of the panel will, uh, will essentially pr provide our, our reaction and, and, uh, and questionings for us and uh, have a chance to give uh, their, uh, you know, if you looked at it from the perspective of the other field, what would it look like, what questions would naturally arise, and perhaps in part of that conversation, it'll actually make the subject matter, the actual content that's being discussed, a little bit clearer to the rest of us. So we, uh, we hope this actually makes it very interesting, uh, interesting format, and we, we, we thought we'd just give it a try. So today we, uh, we have um, uh, you know, three uh, cheerful volunteers, um, <laughs> or, or victims, I don't know which. And, <laughs> And so uh, we're, we're, uh, we really appreciate their uh, uh, you know, diving in on this. Um, first, uh, in, for our, our mathematics side of the, uh, of the world, uh, uh, Maciek Dvorsky, um, UC Berkeley, um, is, of course, a mathematician. Uh, he's been working on scattering theory and micro and local analysis. Uh, he's fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and was an invited speaker at the 2002 International Congress of Mathematicians. Uh, he received his PhD from MIT in 89, after which he went to faculty positions at Harvard and Johns Hopkins and Toronto before coming to Berkeley in 98, um, where he's been. Um, from UCSF, uh, uh, Jonathan Weissman is, uh, is joining us as our life sciences uh, representative. And uh, he's widely recognized for building innovative tools for broadly exploring organizational principles of biological systems. And these include ribosome profiling, um, which globally monitors protein translation, and CRISPR I slash A for turning human genes off and on. Um, I, by the way, I've always noticed that the biologists uh, really come with the best acronyms. Um, and it does mean that you have to have biologists sitting next to you, though, to do the translation. So I hope everybody has one lined up. And, okay. um, He's a, uh, Jonathan's professor at UCSF School of Medicine. Um, after obtaining his PhD in physics from MIT, he pursued a postdoctoral fellowship training at uh, Yale University School of Medicine. And he's received the Raymond and Beverly Sackler International Prize in Biophysics and the National Academy of Sciences Award for Scientific Discovery and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And then uh, finally for uh, our home field, physics, um, and fundamental physics at that, uh, Rafael Busso is uh, also Berkeley. Um, he's a theoretical physicist and cosmologist, recognized for discovering the Busso bound, which limits how much quantum information can be stored in the universe, in case you were worried. <laughs> and he, he co-discovered the language of, uh, the landscape of string theory, um, explaining why empty space weighs surprisingly little. Raphael received his PhD from Cambridge University in 98 and went on to become a postdoc at Stanford University. He's also worked at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara. And in 2002 and three, he was a fellow at Harvard University Physics Department and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. And then in July 2003, he joined the physics department at UC Berkeley. So th these will be our, our, uh, our representatives today of our, of our respective fields. And, uh, but then moderating the session is, is Ihan Cho, Cho um, from Nature. And, uh, and Ihan uh, has over a decade of experience in scientific publishing and is a senior strategy editor for the uh, journal Nature, leading a team of editors in the evaluation and selection of neuroscience research advances for publication, including sensory and motor systems, decision making, executive function, psychiatric disease. And she's also developing strategic approaches for validating and disseminating work that addresses societal challenges. Ihan received her BA at Harvard, and after obtaining her PhD in brain and cognitive sciences at MIT, she pursued postdoctoral research at UCSF. So uh, Ihan is going to be acting as the uh, moderator who manages to you know, uh, keep the three-ring circus in action. And, uh, and so I will pass the, pass the ball over to her. I wish everybody good luck.
Thanks very much, Saul. Um, thank you very much to the Breakthrough Prize Symposium organizers for inviting me to this uh, undoubtedly interesting conversation that is about to befall us. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping first. We have three great talks up ahead, and following each talk, we will uh, engage in this um, interrogation of the speaker by his peers, um, in which the other two speakers will ask all the basic and frank questions that uh, some proportion of the audience is thinking in their heads but is too afraid to ask. And so for that, we thank them in advance. Um, and uh, following this, we'll also have a little bit of uh, interaction and discussion with the audience. So first up, Maciek, please. Oh, here it is. So a quick disclaimer, since it's a very short talk, I'll give no references or attributions, but there is a place on my homepage where one can find an annotated talk with, with some references and, and attribution. So I'll first talk about dynamics and statistics in a very simple way. Then I'll talk a little bit about zeta functions, one of the tools to understand dynamics and statistics. And then I will talk about integrability, chaos, and beyond. And the beyond part is somewhat speculative because I'll point out we got sort of stuck with simple things. So what are dynamical systems? So here is, here is the simplest dynamical system, really. It's actually not so simple. It's a billiard table. So on the left is a billiard table that you can sort of imagine playing billiards on. On the right is sort of mathematician's billiard table. You would not want to play billiards on that table. As you can see from the next point of view, you know, with one ball, you don't see so much. If you send 100,000 balls, then you see a dramatic difference between these two billiard tables. On the left, the motion is in some sense linear, actually the, in a precise sense. On the right side, the motion is somehow nonlinear. Another way to put it is that on the left, the motion is completely integrable. To a scientist, completely integrable normally means that you can solve the problem completely. To a mathematician, it means that in some canonical coordinates, the motion is in fact linear. On the right side, the motion is nonlinear. You cannot really put it in coordinates in which you will have particles moving on straight lines. And the dependence on initial conditions is extremely sensitive. So that's why we would sometimes call it chaotic. Another way to look at it in this chaotic case is to observe the following fact that as time goes on, the distribution of positions and directions in which the particles are moving is, in fact, uh, uh, uniform. So if I look at the, the, the volume, uh, the area, the number, sorry, the number of balls in this, in this rectangle here, uh, then actually as time goes on, it starts converging with some fluctuations, which are interesting, but actually it converges exponentially to just a proportion of the area in that red box. And likewise, the distribution of directions of these balls becomes uniform, yes. And uh, one question one could ask is, how long do I have to wait to have uniform distribution? So for instance, uh, if I give you a billiard table, which somehow we know is chaotic, how would you compute this time? And it turns out that the answer is motivated by, by methods which, which go back to the most famous function of mathematics. So it's almost a cliche to mention it, namely the Riemann zeta function. So the Riemann zeta function is a generating function for prime numbers. So prime numbers are, you know, one, three, five, seven, those are the ones I know. So then, but, but there, are, there are infinitely many of them, yes. So, so you can, you can uh, take a product of a prime numbers there are infinitely many of them, so there are some issues about convergence of this sum. You, you take infinitely many terms, there's a problem. But it turns out that this function actually makes sense for all values of s in the complex plane. It has a singularity at one point, has many interesting zeros that I will not talk about. The way to see these zeros, because I, I want to use this slide later, is for instance to look at the logarithm of this absolute value of this function, the minus zeros correspond to peaks in the logarithm. So logarithm of zero is minus infinity, minus, minus infinity is plus infinity, so, so there are peaks. But actually those fluctuations are visible even in other places, not just where the zeros appear. So there's a dynamical analog of this function, which plays a role uh, in the study of statistics of, of, of these dynamical systems, and that is the Ruel zeta function. And the Ruel zeta function basically does the following thing. It's constructed by replacing primes with prime closed orbit. And what is a prime closed orbit? If you look at that simple orbit, which just goes back and forth, that is a closed orbit. 
forever, it will just bounce back and forth. And the prime one is that you will just allow it to go once, close its loop once, you don't want it to go over again. I also plotted the an orbit which is very close to this uh, closed orbit, which you can see how unstable it is, and this actually is what makes this system chaotic, is this instability of closed orbit. So in the Ruel zeta function, you replace prime numbers with the length of the closed orbits, or exponential of length. So this is this function here. This is the Ruel zeta function, very much like the Riemann zeta function, except instead of primes, you now have uh, e to the t gamma, where t gamma is the length of your primitive orbit, or prime closed orbit. And it turns out that the zeros and poles of this function provide a lot of information about the statistical properties of the dynamical system, like this billiard table, even though I have to say that I'm cheating a little bit because for billiard tables, actually, mathematically, it is not known that we, we, underst we don't understand this function. And, but actually, a very closely related zeta function contains the information about the time at which you achieve uniform distribution. And thanks to various numerical methods, one could actually obtain this number from calculating the zeta function. Of course, not by taking a product, because it doesn't converge in the suitable, in the, in the place of interest, but by, by more sophisticated methods. So this is all very well. But what is the trouble with all this? So we have, I did not talk about integrable systems like this rectangular table, but there there's you know, lots of information and so on and so forth. The trouble is, as one can imagine from any realistic system, very few things are purely completely integrable or purely chaotic. In fact, if I were to sort of uh, you know, express my own view, there are more physical systems that can be adequately modeled by completely integrable things than by purely chaotic things. And uh, so, 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 for instance, you know, if you take, you, you want to construct the simplest example of a, of, a, of a system which exhibits some sort of chaotic behavior. So one normally thinks of the Lorentz uh, system, you know, that, that's a famous system in climate. But actually, there's a simpler system. So this is a system of differential equations. Dot means differential in time. I have three variables. They satisfy this equation. Now, why is it simplest? I, I'll make a technical aside to mathematicians. Because I can remember that system in a cocktail party because I know the basic contact form and I know a Gaussian and that's a contact flow for this. So for instance, I could actually reproduce it if after a few drinks. Well, the Lorentz system I'll never remember. <laughs> and chaotic behavior means that there are some positive Lyapunov exponents. You have this expansion property at some places in the three space. So, but, on, but, but the behavior of orbits can be dramatically different, depends where you start. These are solutions of this system of equations starting with different initial conditions. Here you have something which resembles this completely integrable motion, like the one in the case of the rectangle, and here you have a chaotic trajectory. And uh, actually, very little is known about this system or systems like it. Now, one way to visualize this system is using sort of a notion of a Poincaré section. You take a plane, so here is just the z plane, x3 equals to zero, and you take any trajectory, any time this trajectory crosses the plane, you put a dot. Now, this allows us to, to understand, well, three dimensions is not so bad, but it's already complicated enough, so we reduce the dimension to two dimensions. We take a few orbits, and we color code them. And this is what we get. I mean, probably, you know, everybody's seen pictures like it. And uh, the blue dots are actually just, just one orbit hitting this plane. And uh, they actually, you, you may, you, at first you may not think that it's uniformly distributed, but the measure, there's a Gaussian, and because of this, you know, you sort of expect that there will be fewer dots outside of the origin. Well, you know, it's not known, as far as I'm aware, it's not known, for instance, that the, that the blue region, the chaotic region, has um, positive volume. But, you know, suppose it has positive volume or with respect to some other measure. Do we have equidistribution in the chaotic sea, just as we had it in the case of the billiard? Do things sort of get equidistributed? So here, when I see chaotic sea, I mean this blue region. So this is an example of a mixed system, a system which has both pieces which behave like a completely integrable system and pieces where you have chaotic behavior. And uh, very little is known. So as I said, one question is, do we have equidistribution in the chaotic sea? 
Well, the other thing is that, you know, this system was three-dimensional, so it's very simple, but you could ask uh, what happens in many degrees of freedom or in different dimensions? Do we have, uh, can we use the ideas from chaotic dynamics to, to study those realistic systems? So here is an example which is relevant to us in California because we are all hoping that El Nino is going to bring a lot of rain. So here is a, a picture of what's called the power spectrum of El Nino. So I can't completely explain it, but it's not unlike the zeta function picture. So there's a parameter here. So one should really look at the slice, like for instance, this first graph here, and then look at the slice of the zeta function here. You see some fluctuations. These fluctuations here are in fact, some authors whom I cite in the annotated version, in fact, I, since this is not the only not homemade picture, it comes from, from here. They claim that those peaks here are responsible, uh, sorry, that, that what's responsible for those peaks are zeros of, in fact, some zeta function corresponding to this dynamical system, except that it's some reduction that certainly a mathematician cannot grasp because it it's, um, involves some reduction of an extremely complicated system. So I conclude with some kind of very open questions, and one is sort of related to this. Can we bring the methods which have been successful in the study of chaotic systems to the study of mixed systems? Very unclear at this point, but it's kind of, otherwise, you know, the, the study of this chaotic system is all very well mathematically, but since realistically they practically don't <coughs> exist except in our inflamed imagination, it would be nice if those methods could be used to study mixed systems. What happens on the quantum level? We understand very well, or a lot, a lot, we understand a lot about quantization of completely integrable systems. We know a lot about the behavior of quantum states for systems for which classical dynamics is purely chaotic. Very little is known for mixed systems. So mathematically, this means I would, the simplest mathematical question is to study statistics of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Well, can we visualize and understand more complicated, multidimensional, multiparticle systems using ideas from chaotic dynamics? Attempts are made, but it's, it's not, uh, not that at all yet, at least not in mathematics. And the final thing, this is kind of a crazy question, is there a chance that perhaps underneath some mixed systems there is some completely integrable structure that may seem completely wacko, but you know, random matrix theory, which has a lot of completely integrable structure behind it, models quantum systems with chaotic dynamics. So it's not maybe so incredible, so maybe some mixed systems could be studied these methods. After all, you know, at some point nobody expected that even total lattice of KDV are completely integrable. So, okay, so I conclude with my movie, and thank you for your attention. So uh, being the biologist and the completely naive one, I'll start with a, a, a simple question. You, you showed us in the beginning these really compelling pictures of the billiard balls, and you gave us a perfect rectangle or a very sp and then a very specific structure. Yes. As you go, as you make the rectangle imperfect, does it quickly go to chaotic? Or did, did you have, did the specific structure that you showed us, was that a very peculiar one to give you this pro these properties? Well, so one could deform a rectangle if one makes it a circular, circular borders. I believe, though I don't know to what extent it's a theorem, that it would actually become chaotic. But if you made but, a little defect in the rectangle? Oh, a little defect, it will not change it. Or at least it will not change in the sense that what normally will happen with a small defect that a lot of completely integrable structure will stay on and will become a mixed system, possibly. And could I ask you to define a mixed system? A mixed system to me is a system, so maybe that's not, I'm not really especially in dynamical systems, my, my sort of expertise here is rather tangential, but it's a system which is neither completely integrable, that is a system in which you cannot have some coordinates which the flow is linear, or which is completely chaotic, namely that the trajectories have this very strong divergence property. And uh, so, for instance, our solar system is a mixed system. Hmm. And, uh, you know, that's a system that's still studied, actually, both in physics and mathematics, and for good reasons, because, you know, 
we heard of all sorts of failed missions uh, to all sorts of places. And you said most of the world is sort of existing in these mixed systems. And well, that at least, you know, I don't see, you know, if I look at this room, so scattering by, for instance, scattering by hard spheres is a chaotic system. So here we have the heads of many wise people. So that produces some chaotic behavior. If you would look at some sort of, suppose we, we had some sort of, you know, reflection of, I don't know, light. But on the other hand, the walls are pretty rectangular and so on. So there will be some complete integrability, I would say. So it is a mixed system, I would, I would guess, though, you know. <laughs> but I, you know, I'm a mathematician. We, you know, we are sort of, uh, I wish I could understand the billiards, you know, frankly. <laughs> so, you know. Okay, I'll, I'll start with a non-technical question. Are, are you secretly a physicist? No, I'm, I'm a, no, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a, you know, I, I, I start as a kid as a chemist, then I want to be a physicist, and you know, many mathematicians are failed physicists. So I'm a failed <laughs> physicist, I think, is the first well, statement, yes. I guess what I would like to understand better is, uh, you know, you, you both presented fascinating physical systems uh, that are full of rich structure, but also fascinating <laughs> mathematical objects that we would love to understand yes. better. And, is the flow here both ways, or is it mostly that you're gaining intuition about the mathematical objects uh, from physical structures and then taking off from there and trying to prove things rigorously? Or is it mostly, you know, you're trying to use math to, to, to explain things in physics? Which way does it go, or both ways? Well, I, I won't speak for myself, but I'll speak sort of about the history of the subject. And I think actually dynamical systems is one example in which there is an interesting, uh, you know, back and forth because it started in physics, but on the other hand, you know, Poincaré was maybe the father of modern theory of dynamical systems. He told us to look for closed orbits and so on. And then, and then of course, there were developments in physics, but people like uh, Ruel, whom I mentioned, uh, used uh, thermodynamical formalism, which clearly had origins in physics to produce a mathematical formalism. The computational methods for calculating the zeta functions were developed by physicists studying quantum chaos and things like that maybe 20 years ago. And uh, now uh, those methods are used by mathematicians to study zeta functions for systems which are completely mathematical. So I would say in at least, uh, you know, in, in my limited uh, sort of knowledge of, of mathematics and physics, this is actually a good example when there's very good back and forth between the two subjects, of course, over many years, that uh, you know, mathematics, and of course, many people are, you know, I've mentioned just a few names, but it's a big subject which, you know, is still active. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a, a probably an unanswerable question, but okay. yeah, I'd try. So, as a biologist, we think of ourselves having twenty thousand genes or so, and they're put together with with all sorts of feedback loops and transcription factors that turn on a gene, and that gene, when it gets turned on, makes a protein that feeds back in a positive or negative way. And it ends up being what we think a few hundred different cell types that are in some sense clearly stable. Um, is it is there something useful we can think about? And is it surprise? At some level, it's, it's not chaotic, right? You're not going through all the states. Yes, well, uh, 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 you're right. It's an unanswerable question. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it is a dynamical... So, so I can only... So I'm, again, not a specialist, but the solar system. But in the solar system, there are areas of instability. And because of this, whatever was floating there maybe at some point flew away and there's empty space. There are some other areas which have lots of stuff floating there. There is some stability there. So perhaps in this di very complicated dynamical system, uh, you know, I'm not trying to go into astrology, trying to explain biology mm -hmm. using, you know, the motion of celestial bodies, but, <laughs> but maybe in, the, in this dynamical system, which is the, the human body, uh, you know, it evolved so that the chaotic path uh, were eliminated that, because they led to, to crazy outcomes, not that we are necessarily yeah. lacking in that's those. Exactly you know, the uh, nature. Uh, yeah. no, that's exactly the nature mm -hmm. of the question. Is it, is it so unsurprising that this is that you have these such stable systems that this must be well, very heavy evolutionary pressure or if you throw things out at I think biology is too complicated at this <laughs> point for us to, to really understand it from that point of view. I have to, I mean, that's at least, you know, I, but, but you know, the solar system still is not understood. That's very simple after all, you know. <laughs> And, and, but, but is there, you know, stability and instability determines what's mm -hmm. full and what's empty. 
But experimentally, we could just create different dynamic systems by messing things up. That is true, but the, the dimension is enormous, I suppose, here, because you have all this, so it's a dimensionality problem again. But, you know, maybe that sounds... You can have closed systems with three uh -huh. factors. And okay, well, then, then one could run it on the computer and see what happens, and then... Uh, can I ask you a different question? So, well, it's actually related. I mean, we have we, we struggle often to define what we mean by complexity. Uh -huh. um, and thinking about the examples you gave, uh -huh. Uh -huh. both integrable systems and completely chaotic systems are in some sense probably not very complex. The ones are too simple and the other ones are too messed up for interesting things to happen. Is there a way that you can turn this idea of mixed systems into a way of quantifying the uh, complexity uh, of a system? I mean, the solar I system being mixed yes, is I, that I, don't, I, I, again, uh, don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, there are many ideas about complexity of systems, uh, such as entropy and so on, developed on one hand in statistical mechanics, but then have a new life in the theory of dynamical systems, but mostly chaotic systems, sort of completely integrable systems have zero entropy and so on. But many people would take issue that completely integrable systems are too simple. You know, there, there are many... You know, I, mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, the dangerous statement potentially because as somebody says, physics books are catalogs of completely integrable systems. Well, you know. it's a lamppost situation, right? We, yeah. we work on what we can solve. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, we need to move on. Uh, next speaker is Jonathan Weissman. I'm going to talk about uh, a new technology uh, that we've been working on uh, that allows us to turn off gene and on genes at will. And I'd like to really focus a little bit on the motivation first, and then I'll uh, go into a bit of the nuts and bolts of how we did it, and then come back to talk about some of the applications and why we're excited about them. So, you know, it's an amazing fact that a complex organism like uh, this baby here r contains hundreds of different uh, cell types, but each of these cells as we know, has uh, exactly the same DNA. And the reason why they're able to get all these different states is, as my uh, daughter says, uh, they have reading from the same book, but they had different chapters. It means that they're turning on different sets of genes. And it's these sets of genes that determine the cell fate and gives us this enormous diversity of cell types. We also know, thanks to sequencing, that our DNA is almost identical to that of our closest neighbors, the chimpanzees. So something like 98% identity. And when you look at the proteins, they're even closer. So we think that much of the reason why we're different from a chimpanzee is not that they were playing with a different set of proteins. It's just that these proteins are turned on and off at different times, so different growth factors and, and different neurotrophic factors, for example. And then finally, many disease states result from the inappropriate turning on or off of a gene. So for example, when we lose genes that are responsible, that are breaks on growth, so-called tumor suppressor genes, uh, this is an important step in the transformation from a normal cell to a, a, a cancer cell. Thanks to very cool technology, which I don't have time to go into, and increasing, with increasing precision, over the last 20 years, we've been able to watch the le expression levels of every gene in any cell. Now we can do it in a single cell. We can, thanks to some technology I worked on, we can watch directly not the messenger RNA, but actually the, the amount of the protein that's being produced. And we have increasing number of assays that let us look with exquisite detail at the internal state of the cell. And this has been very powerful but in some sense, it's not very satisfying. It's like you're stuck watching a movie and you have no control over what the plot is and what the fate is and what would happen if you could watch this movie and say, well, what if this character died uh, in uh, scene two? Or what if this character walked in at, at scene three? Uh, all of this is a way of saying that we'd like to be able to go beyond watching the expression level of all our different genes to being able to control them and to control them precisely and to, in a multiplexed way. And, and there have been a number of technologies. Uh, RNAi was really the break, uh, breakthrough technology that started to make us think that this is possible. Uh, but 
there are intrinsic challenges to using RNAi uh, to turn off genes. And I won't go into all the technical challenges, but I think the really big story is that RNAi is an intrinsic critical part of the cell. And so for us to try to jury rig this, to do what we wanted to do, to turn off a specific gene or a specific set of genes, always has a challenge because we're trying to use something that's important for the cell. So it's much better to come in with an external system, a completely orthogonal system that lets us do this. And, and that would have seemed uh, almost impossible a, a few years ago, except for, uh, so we really want a volume switch. Sorry, I missed the, uh, I missed the slide. Uh, so um, the breakthrough in the, uh, was really the discovery or the development of a programmable uh, nuclease uh, by, uh, culminated in a, a beautiful paper uh, from Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna that was, of course, uh, honored by the Breakthrough Prize last year. And uh, Jennifer did a, a beautiful job at describing, for those of you who are in the biology seminar, uh, a beautiful job at describing this system, but basically uh, working on uh, a, a really elegant work on adaptive immunity in bacteria. So bacteria were able to learn when they were infected with the virus, learn about that virus, and be protected from it. Uh, they were able to find a, a single protein uh, called Cas9 and uh, make a, a single chimeric guide RNA, so sgRNA. And together, uh, these two uh, formed what we call an endonuclease. And that's just a fancy way of saying this is a protein that cuts DNA. There are lots of proteins that cut DNA. But what makes this one so special is that where it cuts the DNA is determined solely by this uh, uh, single guide RNA, by the simple rules of hybridization. So if we have a sequence ACGTA, we can just make the complementary RNA to that sequence, and that will guide this endonuclease to cut there and only there. And so with this programmable endonuclease, we can now, in a simple, uh, easily designable way, uh, cut DNA at any place. So this, was, uh, this work was published in uh, summer of 2012, and it immediately, uh, it, was, it was, of course, in their paper, the, the implications of it, but it was immediately applied, taking it out of bacteria and putting this in mammalian cells uh, in order uh, to edit genomes, to, uh, <coughs> to cut uh, mammalian genomes at any place we want, take advantage of a so-called repair or homologous uh, uh, different repair mechanisms that would either uh, lead to deletion or uh, if you could put in a copy of the DNA that you wanted to be replaced to uh, change the DNA at will. And this ignited, in a set of papers that were published at the very beginning of 2013, has ignited the genome editing revolution that we've heard so much about and that's, uh, that's changing science and, and medicine as we speak. But concurrent with this, we, and I just have to say the, the real star of this at the beginning was uh, uh, Stanley Chi, who was then a fellow uh, at UCSF, uh, thought that we could have an alternate uh, use of this technology, which is we would break the scissors so that this Cas9 protein can no longer cut DNA. It would not change the genome in any way. But it would still be programmable. And now we have a programmable protein binding uh, platform where we can target this protein to any place within our genome. And with this, you could do things like uh, block uh, transcription. So as we did in, in the first paper that was published uh, concurrent with the very first genome editing papers. So you could just have it be a roadblock to the enzymes that turn DNA into RNA to turn on genes. You could put in uh, modifying enzymes that uh, change these epigenetic marks that permanently turn on or off genes, for example. Or uh, you could fuse a protein, a green fluorescent protein that emits uh, light. And with this, watch where this locus that we, in the DNA chromosomes that we've marked with GFP is as a function of time and do this without changing the DNA in any way and do this in a live cell. So this leads to these rather spectacular pictures uh, in work that was led by Bo Huang, uh, my colleague at UCSF, uh, where 
Uh, here he's marking so-called telomeres or the ends of the DNA, and you can see them watching, moving in time, and from this get enormous amount of dynamic information about how this uh, mass of DNA in our cells are moving and how this is changing as genes are turned on and off. So really, I think the sort of big picture way I think of this is Cas9 has allowed us to edit the genome in this programmable way. And DCAS9 has now allowed us to edit the epigenome in a similarly powerful manner. I'm going to focus, though, on just two uses of this DCAS9 technology, to turn down the expression or turn up the expression of individual genes. So uh, turning down actually turned out to be quite simple because we were working on uh, building on a lot of work that had been done previously uh, before uh, we had the DCAS9 tool. And this work had defined different domains that were able to turn off transcription, shut off a gene when they're in proximity to that gene. So our favorite one is a crab domain. So we fuse this DCAS9 to this domain that says any gene nearby, and they have to be quite nearby, uh, uh, just shut it off. And uh, it worked beautifully well. Like, it seems like, as with so many things with uh, CRISPR, it kind of works better than you could have hoped for. So, Here's an example where we've targeted the expression of gene. As it turns out, it happens to be uh, GFP again, but that's completely incidental. And we've used the tools, I said, that let us watch the, how high or low the expression is of every other gene in the cell, including GFP, either when we didn't target it or when we did. And what you see is every other gene within the noise of the experiment is exactly the same, whether we targeted GFP or didn't target GFP. And the GFP levels are dropped by about 100-fold. So really, it's showing that we have this laser tool that lets us, in a designable way, specifically turn down this gene. And we've now, we and others have now done uh, many more experiments to, to show the specificity of this repression. So to turn on genes, we basically use the same trick. We took uh, uh, domains from, uh, uh, from a virus that had been well characterized for the specialist uh, VP16 from a herpes virus, fused it to Cas9 and uh, brought this to a specific region near, for example, your target gene. And it turned out when we brought in one or even four copies of this VP16, it could turn on some genes, but many genes that really didn't do a good job. So we had to uh, do some sort of uh, neat uh, tricks to really power this up and bring up 40 different domains of VP16. So you know, biologists are simple-minded. If you get a little bit with two domains or four domains, why not put in 40? And remarkably, this works. And, and this was really uh, this sort of technology, so co we call it SunTag technology, was uh, uh, masterminded by uh, Marvin Tannenbaum, who was a uh, postdoc in Ron Vale's lab. So with this, we could now uh, specifically upregulate a gene. So we had the tools to turn off and turn on any single gene. So as I said, biologists are sort of simple-minded. Once we could turn on or off any single gene, we decide we should turn on or off all the genes at once. And basically, the way we did this was to first learn the principles where you're supposed to put these guide RNAs and then uh, make a library uh, of different guide RNAs uh, with different guide RNAs targeting each gene. And um, I, the ways in we were able to do this in a genome-wide way was thanks to a, a really nifty technology that I had nothing to do with, but have adv taken advantage of enormously. Um, it's a technology from Agilent where they make different uh, pieces of oligos or pieces of DNA that are acting as uh, these guide RNAs, um, and they use an inkjet technology. But instead of doing CMYK, they print ACGT, and in the same way that you get many, many little dots in, a, in an inkjet in the high resolution picture, you get many, many different oligos. So you can make 250,000 oligos. So if we have 20,000 genes, um, you can do more than 10 uh, different guide RNAs for every gene and do this really trivially. So just to so uh, finish a bit with what this is useful for, so we can define the relationship between the level of expression, how much of any gene or protein we're making, and how it's affecting the behavior or so-called phenotype of the cell. Uh, we can do uh, genome-wide for genetic screens. So anything that the cell does uh, or an organism does, we can uh, look for genes that are important for this and to do this in a very simple and automatic way. 
And it doesn't have to be just uh, protein coding. We can look at non-coding genes. Um, we can do overexpression genes. We, can we know that, for example, in cancer, a major mechanism of overexpression of, of resistance is that it tr uh, makes many copies of a gene that gives resistance, and we can find out uh, which of these genes might confer resistance. And then we can do uh, massively parallel combinations. So we do not one, but uh, combinations of two. So if we have 20,000 genes, that's 400 million copies, different combinations. It's a bit more than we can do, but we can easily do sort of millions at a time. And this is really important for things like synthetic lethal and really important for trying to find uh, combination therapies uh, against, uh, uh, against different diseases. So I just, by way of uh, motivation for that, this is a slide that has become sort of a, a, a paradigm for, this, for the power and, and, and challenges of targeted therapy. Uh, it's a melanoma patient who has a cancer driven by a specific mutation. Uh, a drug that specifically targets this mutation was developed uh, by Roche. And uh, two months of treatment, you get a, more, a really remarkable uh, response. And then after three months, uh, it, you, the cancers figured out a way around these. And not, as, not just one module, but each of these individual modules. And so what we're really trying to do now is to map out all the escape routes ahead of time and develop polytherapy that stops, uh, stops this from happening. So just you know, one final thought, which is uh, uh, echoing what Jennifer said, that all of this came out of really curiosity-driven research. Sequencing random bacteria, uh, trying to uh, study phage, which is a field that you know, many people would have said 40 years ago was it was past its prime, uh, and uh, protecting uh, DEN and protecting their bacterial stocks. And from this, all these wonderful applications have arisen. So just, uh, I finish with thanking the people who've uh, done this work. A tremendous collaboration across the Bay uh, with uh, as I say, Stanley Chi was a key component player, and Wendell and Jennifer, and now uh, with Bob Tejan and Ron Vale. And then in my lab, really, Luke Gilbert and, and Max Horbeck were uh, the key players in developing this. Thanks. So I have a sort of a naive question. So, so I missed the connection between the treatment and this gene cutting or gene uh, turning genes on and off technology, the treatment of this of this uh, patient. Oh, yes, yeah, I, I I went fast. I think the idea here uh, is that that the cancer has many escape routes. You get an effective. You have a driver so-called driver mutation mutation that's turning on a pathway that's critical for the tumor. And we know it's critical. You turn it off, the tumor cells die. Mm -hmm. And you make a drug, and patients respond beautifully. Hmm. But because it's a rapidly evolving mm. uh, pathogen, it, it finds these escape routes. But the idea is there's going to be a limited number of escape routes, we hope. Mm -hmm. And that by being able to do these massively parallel screens with combinations, we can map out what these escape routes are, which genes that you turn on and off, which pathways you turn on and off, are going to allow this tumor to live even in the presence of, our, of this therapy. So the, the, the particular, so it's a pill? Somebody takes a pill, or how does this uh, work? That, that, would be, that would be the ideal. I think uh -huh. the, the and, paradigm. And the pill then does this gene turning on and off? That, is, that is the idea. So in I the see. case of, <clears throat> uh, of this disease, there's a mutation in a protein called BRAF, uh, a mutation at residue 600. Mm -hmm. uh, they, a drug was developed that's specific to this mutant form of BRAF mm -hmm. and turns it off, and the cancer, it, the cancer dies. But not every cell dies. Mm -hmm. And really, the, the model for this is um, uh, HIV, where there were multiple different drugs, protease inhibitors, uh, uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Each alone wouldn't be able to control, uh, control the virus. You basically, the virus goes down, <clears throat> you get mutations that escape, and it comes back full force, mm -hmm. completely resistant. But when you come with a cocktail of two or three or four mm -hmm. uh, different types of inhibitors, now you know you basically each one can knock it down a hundred or a thousand fold. And when you start to combine these, you start to get zero probability of uh, in a finite in any finite time uh, of developing resistance. And that that's the hope. But 
there are a huge number of combinations. You know, with two, mm -hmm. there's 400 million combinations, and we needed a, a faster. Since we can't predict it because we have far too complex a system, uh, we need uh, we need faster ways of being able to explore all the possibilities to find out which are the combinations uh, that will uh, that will together uh, get a robust treatment. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I was really struck by what you said at the beginning about the 98% uh, identical yeah. uh, sort of source code uh, for the chimpanzee and us. <clears throat> and uh, I guess I was wondering about two things. One is, um, just very naively, so then if, if the difference lies in which genes get turned on, is that, encode, is that encoded in the other 2% or is a subset of the other yeah, so, so first of all, you're starting to get beyond my uh, complete expertise, uh, uh, but uh, Svante Pebo would be a, a great person with this, is, you know, mapping out the Neanderthal genome, which was even closer. Um, how much of evolution is occurring by changing the function of a protein as opposed to changing or creating new proteins as opposed to making higher levels, lower levels, is really sort of an, an open question that it's hard to quantitate. But it's clear that you uh, can get changes, for example, in regulatory regions um, upstream that will then change when and where a protein is expressed. You get a single point mutation that now allows a transcription factor to come in that didn't near, wouldn't normally come in and the gene turns on at a different time. There's certainly some spectacular examples where, uh, you know, by, by, in a mouse, by expressing uh, a protein important for making muscles, you get this, they call, uh, the, the, the mighty mouse that we, that's uh, packed with muscles. And, you know, of course, people in the, the uh, cow industry, the meat industry are thinking this could be a great way of packing on extra meat. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, I, I, you know, I got lost, I have to say, but I understood that you were cutting those DNAs, but uh, the, by, by this sort of precisely where you want it to be cut, yes? But do they sort of, can you put them back together or so, uh, somehow in some context? Well, I mean, just, uh, I'm, yeah, that's I'm sure, you know, you guys, you guys, you know, but I, I mean, I, I don't even know quite clearly yeah. what the gene is, quite frankly, so it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little. A, a, it's, a, it's a matter, of, a gene is a unit of inheritance or something. Okay. What we really mean is a piece of DNA, uh -huh. that you have three billion base pairs uh -huh. and a specific piece of DNA, and it might be places that's c telling you to make a protein uh -huh. or telling when that protein goes on and off. Uh -huh. When you do the cutting, the CRISPR cutting, it makes a specific cut. It turns out, as you might expect, DNA breaks all the time, okay. and the body has oh. DNA repair mechanisms uh, for the aficionados. The, the mechanism I'm talking about is non-homologous end joining, so you might see NHEJ. Oh, <clears throat> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Up there with the point carrés. <laughs> but it makes mistakes. It cuts before, after the DNA is cut, it mm. cuts back a little bit, and it puts it back together. Oh, okay. And so th when it puts it back together, one, two, three nucleotides tend to be missing. And if you're in the middle of a protein and you cut out one nucleotide, now the whole protein's messed up because the ribosomes move in steps of three and it loses its strength. Our approach was different in that we don't cut the DNA at all. We break the scissors and we bring in something that prevents the gene from being turned on. So we, we totally prevent Okay. We turn to actually not even, not necessarily totally print. We can turn down the expression level of the RNA that's being made from that DNA. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I, I want to compliment biology on the fact that your volume dials go to eleven. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was surprisingly easy on the internet to get a volume dial that goes to 11. <laughs> there are an enormous number of, of different <laughs> possibilities. So, so now that you have this toolbox of these, these are very precise you know, instruments, as it were, to work at the molecular level, so what do you want to do with the system? Everything? <laughs> no. Um, the part of this is just 
gene discovery to every sort of all the things that we had done in yeast that let us do, you know, find that for any pathway very quickly find what are the genes that are responsible. And that's just a tool we want to get in, in everyone's hands. And I think this is really an important part. Um, biology is really driven by technology, but I think the people who most benefit are those who are embedded in a rich biological problem, understand what the questions are, and can adopt these new tools. So a big part of this is trying to hand these tools over. They're very easy to use. Hand them over to someone who's interested in hedgehog signaling or WINT or whatever pathway or how, how, what determines the size of the cell. Whatever question you want, you can now find the genes that are responsible if you can look at this in the cell. On the other side, the more technology side, we're really interested in doing these massively parallel uh, synthetic lethal double screens. And um, that's more technically challenging. That's something probably a small number of labs should do, uh, should do in, in a large way. Technically, carrying out the data, collecting the data is challenging, but, but not that hard, I think, at this point. The full analysis and getting the richness of this is a, a huge computational problem. And the kind of things that we want to get out of this is, if you imagine you have a pathway that A turns on B turns on C, what we should see is that if it's just a very simple linear pathway, if you get rid of B, there should be no cost to getting rid of A. You should have what's called epistasis. And, if you, and similarly, if you get rid of C, you should have no cost to get rid, getting rid of B. And so by getting this information of what happens when you lose one gene or another, and what happens in the double, and is it more or less than you'd expect from the two singles alone, you get in this unbiased, objective way how a cell is wired up. So we now have an opportunity to map out the wiring of a cell in a way that is much less ad hoc, I think, than how uh, most biology has been done, because we can do this systematically. And what we'd like to do is to map out how cells are wired up under normal conditions, and then in the, as we put in a disease state like this V600E mutation, how is it changing the wiring of the cells? And are there, is there this cell being, the wiring of the cells being changed in a way that's gonna give us opportunities to intervene therapeutically? <coughs> Thank you. So with that, um, moving to the home team. All right. Uh, I'll try to talk a little bit about what gets theoretical physicists excited um, here at Berkeley and also elsewhere. Uh, like Maciek, I'm not going to give a whole lot of references, um, but there are lots of wonderful people whose work has contributed to this. And, um, and so here's what we do. It's hard to follow an act where people are curing cancer. Um, we seek a unified description of nature, um, which is harder than you may think. Um, because mostly because it has to include both gravity and quantum mechanics. So, so those are the two things that are left standing right now as separate pillars in our edifice. And, and we'd like to be able to think of them as one thing. Um, and, and so let me talk about both a little bit. Um, so first, gravity. Gravity is, <clears throat> gravity is sort of at the origin of this beautiful story of of unification, which is modern science to some extent, the idea that we can understand more and more phenomena from simpler and simpler and fewer and fewer principles. Um, it started with Newton recognizing that the force that makes the apple fall from the tree is the same force that makes the moon go around the earth and the earth around the sun and so on. And it was just um, a momentous insight to realize that these earthly and heavenly phenomena are in fact just the same. And, and that's really still what we're after and that's what um, gets us excited and it, it's just such a beautiful thing to have an insight like that or even a hundred times less magnificent than that. Um, and, and so, but he didn't just have this qualitative insight, of course he had a quantitative uh, formula to go with it that's important, otherwise you can't test your theory. Um, he, he, he was able to tell us what the, how strong is this force of gravity in terms of the mass of these particles. Let's, how does this, ah, no. Um, where's the light? For the, oh, here. Yeah, in terms of the mass of the, of the object, Earth and Sun, let's say, and their distance. And then here, this G, that's a sign that we're talking about gravity. This is some constant called Newton's constant that measures the strength of gravity. Um, 
And nothing much happened for several hundred years. And then almost to the day 100 years ago, um, Einstein came up with a new theory of gravity. Um, and it's a great example of how physics works. Of course, he had to reproduce everything that Newton had done. Um, and, and he did, except for tiny corrections to, say, the orbits of planets, which were eventually found to, in fact, occur. Um, but on the other hand, while preserving all of that, he completely changed the perspective. Gravity in this theory of, theory of relativity, general relativity, was no longer a force at all. Gravity was simply particles trying to go the straightest path possible in a curved space-time. And it's hard to imagine four-dimensional curved space-time, but you can imagine what happens if you go the straightest path, poss path possible uh, on Earth. Right? You, it's a curved surface, and you just keep going. There's a notion of going straight, even when your surface is curved. Um, why did he say that that is what causes bodies to fall? He had a good reason for it. He didn't just make it up. He had some guidepost follow. This is called the equivalence principle. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that we're doing similar things now. We're looking for guideposts. Um, the equivalence principle was something that was sort of a coincidence in Newton's theory. It's the fact that all bodies fall at the same rate. I don't know if you've seen this video of the astronauts on moon uh, dropping a feather and a hammer. And with no air resistance getting in the way, you can really see them falling exactly in the same way. It's beautiful. Um, and we're so used to this that we don't think about it much, but Einstein thought about it much. Uh, it's odd, because it didn't have to be that way. It's kind of built into Newton's theory as you know, an, an adjustment that you do by hand. For example, if you, had, if you replace Earth with a big electrically charged ball, and you ask what a bunch of charged particles are going to be, some are going to move away, some are going to uh, fall towards Earth. It depends on which sign their charge has. Some are just going to float if they're uncharged. Bodies can move in different ways under a force field. But in gravity, they don't. And, and that's what got Einstein to this idea that gravity is really a, a fundamental property of space, that there are simply preferred paths, those that are followed by feathers, hammers, and everybody else. And you don't have to go for this complicated intermediate notion of a force that's acting and adjusting to be large for the hammer and small for the feather so that the, you know, it's much simpler requires you to learn some new math, but it's much simpler. <laughs> Quantum mechanics was invented around the same time, about 100 years ago. And the aspect of it that I'll stress is the notion of quantum information. So, uh, well, quantum mechanics, as the name says, introduces a fundamental quantum to our description of nature, a sort of basic unit that you can't break up, which is called Planck's constant, or h-bar. Every time you see an h-bar, we're talking about some quantum mechanical thing. Every time you see a g-newton, we're talking about gravity. Um, and again, people just didn't just make this up. They had to uh, make it up to explain things like why uh, uh, atomic spectra have only certain discrete lines. Why can hydrogen only emit certain wavelengths and not others? But once you know that there's a discrete spectrum of possibilities for any given quantum system because of this fundamental quantum, you can ask how many possibilities. If I give you a box, and I, I, it's a quantum system, you can ask, well, how many different states could that system be in? And that's what I want you to think of as quantum information. If that system can be in only one of two states, we say it contains one qubit. It's kind of like a bit. Okay. Think of your hard drive. And by giving you that system, we could have prearranged that, you know, if, if the bit points up, it means that I had eggs for breakfast. If it points down, it means I had uh, a smoothie. Okay. But with that system, there is no more information I can convey than that. Because that was only one qubit. With a more complex system, with more qubits, I could give you a much longer message. So that's the connection between uh, this quantization and the notion of information that's going to be important uh, for me. Because it's at that level, at the level of quantum information, that we've had the most luck understanding a deep connection between gravity and quantum mechanics, which is in some ways similar to the equivalence principle, this coincidence that Einstein worried about so much and that led him to the right theory. Something that's already there, we can see it in our theories, we can see it in the, in, in the, in the world, um, but it's kind of strange and coincidental and miraculous 
uh, from the point of view of the theories we have today, and it's begging uh, for a description in which it was just inevitable to start with. Okay? And here's the relation. All right. So here's an equation that has Newton's constant on one side, and, and, and it also involves Planck's constant, and so it involves really both quantum mechanics and gravity. And the statement is that the amount of information you can have in a region of space is bounded by the area of the boundary of that region. In measured in certain units, tiny little Planck units. So for example, uh, in this room, let's see if this works, the actual amount of information in this room, if I wrote down uh, on a piece of paper where every molecule is and what it's doing, I would have to write down about 10 to the 28 letters or 10 billion, billion, billion letters. The area of the walls of this room measured in uh, these funny units is 10 to the 72, so in fact it is true that the information is less than the area, great. But it's also true by a huge margin. Um, but that's because we didn't really try very hard. We could start trying to cram a lot of information into this room, put, pack more matter in, condense it uh, with you know, whatever is compatible with the laws of physics. And yes, you can bring up the amount of information a lot. But what you'll find is that before you get to the point where you violate this um, fundamental inequality that I wrote down here, before you get to that point, the, there's so much mass and energy in the room now that the room collapses to a black hole. Mm. And if you now try to add even more mass or energy to store more information, the black hole gets bigger and won't fit into these walls. <laughs> this is a very universal relation. We can apply it not just to, to everyday objects like boxes and rooms. Uh, it's true also for the universe. The area of the walls in this case is, let's say, how far we can see right now. A few billion light years squared. Um, in those units, that's 10 to the 123. The amount of information in the universe turns out, you actually get closer than for this room, it's 10 to the 103 coming mostly from large black holes. Again, the relation is true and you can keep checking it and trying to do your worst to, to break it and, and it just always works, but it's, you have to do it case by case and, and really you'd like to understand where this is coming from. And so we think that this is a hint. First of all, it's surprising. It's not at all what you would have expected. Right. If it wasn't for gravity, and I asked you how much information can you fit into this room, you'd say, well, depends. How small can I make the bits? Right? And I, I make the, take the smallest bits I can make consistent with whatever the laws of nature are, the tiniest particles or something, and then fill the whole room with them. And so the amount of information you're going to fit is basically the volume in the units of the size of the smallest things you can make. <coughs> In particular, if I double the linear size of every dimension of the room, I should be able to store eight times as much information in it at most. In fact, the upper bound goes up only by a factor of four because I'm only making the walls bigger by a factor of four. The other thing that's surprising about this is that it doesn't really matter what the smallest things are, whether they're quarks or strings or something else. Uh, we already know the upper bound anyway on how much information we can fit. And it's interesting, as I already said, because it seems to give us a hint about at least one important property that our quantum theory of gravity that we're after must have. It must connect space-time and matter and quantum mechanics in such a way that this relation is obvious from the start. And so we'd love to be like Einstein and work our way up to this theory from having discovered this wonderful principle, sometimes called the holographic principle. Uh, and, and, and that's fun, and so far we haven't succeeded, and that may be because we're not as smart as Einstein. It may be because the problem is harder, or both. Um, what I don't think it is, is I don't think it's because this is not a very powerful principle. I think it's an extremely powerful principle, and in fact it's doing things for us that the equivalence principle never did to the contemporaries of Einstein. We're already learning from, by thinking about the connection between information and geometry, we're learning things about the theories we thought we knew that we never would have guessed, and which are simple, beautiful, fundamental properties of them, which, because we already know them, we can even prove. But again, we wouldn't have guessed them. Here's an example. So let me just fast forward here. It's long been a bit puzzling that, but it's known, that in, in quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, um, 
we can have negative energy in some regions of space. We can have negative mass. It's okay. You can explicitly write down states that do this. If you've heard of something like Casimir energy, it's an example of that. Um, and that's kind of disconcerting. What are you going to do with that? There seems to be no limit. Nobody was ever able to write down a lower bound on, on how negative you can get this energy, how much negative energy. Um, by thinking about the connection between information and geometry, but then taking a limit where general relativity is no longer important, we were able to discover something about quantum mechanics we hadn't understood before. We now understand that there is a lower bound on how negative the energy can get in terms of how quickly a flow of information can be turned off. If it turns off very quickly, that means you, at that point, uh, you're allowed to have a lot of negative energy. If, on the other hand, if the flow of information is ramping up, uh, that means that the energy not only has to be positive, but has to have a certain minimum amount that's set by that rate of ramping up. Very beautiful connection. We, we can prove it within quantum field theory, but we would have never thought of even writing it down, let alone trying to prove it, were it not for this inheritance that it has from quantum gravity. Another example that I'll just mention briefly, I, I, I said earlier the walls of the universe in which we live is basically how far out we can see. And tomorrow we'll see a little farther, because light has had more time to come reach us. And there's long been a kind of intuition that that should mean that the walls get bigger. The area of the walls of the, of the region that surrounds our universe should get bigger as we wait. And it's true in our universe, it's obvious that they do, uh, because we already know it's expanding. But we can now prove, again, starting from, from a conjecture that's natural from, from the viewpoint of, of quantum gravity, but then prove rigorously within Einstein's theory that you know, subject to a certain very large class of, of, of observers, we will always see the area of the walls we live in go up. <coughs> it's kind of like a second law of thermodynamics for, for cosmology. And so I'll end with that. Thank you. I see why I'm a mathematician, not a physicist, I'm afraid. I, 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 uh, was there a picture of a quince on your first slide? That's <laughs> correct. Yeah. Yes. OK, because I, I thought, is this in honor of the fact that uh, baked quinces were a favorite dessert of Sir Isaac Newton? Or? Uh, no, I no. think it's my mm -hmm. I own this yes. quince. Oh, it's not. Uh, anyway, it, yeah, it's, it's oh. close enough to an apple. And yeah, probably 99% of the genome, I suppose, the same as apples. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, probably not. They have a lot of replicated regions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so chimpanzees and humans are closer than quinces and apples? I would like to check my facts before. Okay. In, the, okay. in okay. the days before Google, I would assert quickly, oh. but you know, since someone here can can fact check me. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry to be starting on a light note, but I, will, I found it very... But I have one question, you know, this miniaturization question. So within quantum mechanics, without gravity, you could make things as small as possible? I, I don't completely understand that. Well, the language that we use, quantum field theory, uh -huh. uh, in principle allows us to do that. Now, we don't understand what quantum field theory actually looks like at arbitrarily short distances. Uh -huh. Um, and we certainly had reason to expect that at a distance corresponding to some ridiculously small fraction of, of, mm -hmm. of, of a millimeter, um, it does not make sense to speak of quantum field theory anymore because, in fact, if you tried to localize to that distance, you'd make a tiny little black uh -huh. hole. Right? Uh -huh. But what's surprising is that even if you thought that that was the limit, uh, you might still think that you can make little cubes of that tiny distance distance size mm -hmm. and fill and fill the uh, the room with it and store as much information as as as, as the number of the cubes that fit into the room uh, but but the answer is no because in fact gravity becomes incredibly strong as you try to scale this up mm -hmm. and so you make a if, if you try to do that you'd make a black hole vastly larger than this room mm -hmm. sorry I have uh, two questions that are probably different. 
Um, but just if you could give us a, a without you know going into all the details, a, a better sense. One is why area. Good. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. Why area? That I think it's a it's a it's a very it's a great question, and I think it's a it's a deep question. Um, I think we'll know the answer when we know what quantum gravity is in more detail. But we can sort of understand why it couldn't really have been anything else. So, um, for example, it is so good. Um, the thing that we really are supposed to look at when we compare the area to the amount of information that is supposed to be, you know, limiting is, I lied to you, it's not actually like the, the, the information that's in the walls of the room at one instant of, a, of time. It is what would be seen by a bunch of light rays that traverse the room when they all flash up at some instant of time on that area that constitutes the walls. And then they start moving towards the center of the room. And of course, for practical purposes for the room, that's the same thing. In the universe, it's not always the same thing because lots of stuff happens while the light rays are traveling. Mm -hmm. Now, this connection between areas and what are called light sheets, the objects on which you measure the amount of information. This is why the holograph? Is, holog well, no. In fact, the word hologram was invented just based on the idea that everything would be bounded by the area. And it's ironic that it then turned out that you have to use uh, light rays to make the connection precise. But, but the, uh, the, the notion that you, you start with an area and then you look at light rays that are moving away from it, that's a construction that would have no analog for any other geometric object. You can only do that if you start with an area. And so this is kind of a roundabout explanation. It's sort of, well, if some construction like this was going to work, it better had to be the area that played a role. But I think in the end, you know, we're going to understand how space and time are put together. And it's going to be a construction where areas and these light sheets play a sort of primary role. It, the things that come pretty early in the, mm -hmm. in the construction manual. Um, and, and that's where it's going to have to come from. So I think it's, it would be premature for me to try to answer your question um, better than, than I can. So maybe yeah. it, it is somewhat related to my next question, which is uh, my understanding was a long time ago that I you know, uh, took a class in general relativity. But that early on 1905 or so, once the equivalence principle it was sort of clear to Einstein that there was, it was geometry and that algebraic geometry was the tool and it was about getting the right equation to figure out how uh, the, the right tensor equation. But it was sort of very clear before, there were 10 years where it was sort of, the, clear, the path was clear and then it was solving this. Is there some steps forward, and you tried to elude this, that you can move forward from this principle towards a unification? Uh, yeah, I think there are, there, there are a number of, so what's nice about this principle is that it's very general. You can apply it to this room, you can apply it to the universe, you can apply it to all the solutions that we've ever thought about uh, of, of Einstein's theory, and it seems to always work. Mm -hmm. What's not so great about it is that it's not a theory yet. It's just a hint about some structure that theory should have. Um, and we get some reassurance that it's the right hint by the fact that it always works and by the fact that we're learning new things about old theories from it. But we also are lucky enough to have uh, a full theory of quantum gravity, uh, which is sort of at the other end of the extreme. It's a complete theory, but it only works in one kind of universe or class of universes, which are totally not like ours. And, um, and, so, and so, you know, it's not, it's not like, well, so I think it's, a, yeah, it's not just a detail, right? So it's, it's, it's important that we have these different tools at our disposal because it's a very hard problem. It's important that we can study certain questions in a completely controlled setting um, where, you know, we understand how to calculate everything. But unfortunately, because this universe is not like ours, while we may learn some interesting things about black holes, which can exist there too, we're not going to learn something about the Big Bang, which, which doesn't exist there. We're not going to learn about how un our universe started, at least not in any obvious way. And so that's, that's something. So, so I think what we're trying to do is really take lessons from, from both sides, both work our way up um, based on general principles and guesswork, and then make a connection with the precise theories that we already have and try to extract as many lessons as possible from those. 
and hope that, you know, at some point it, the gaps will start filling in. Let's uh, bring the audience in now. So, um, okay, could you please identify yourself and also uh, tell us your background from which you are coming? Uh, my name is Andras Pelionis. Uh, I'm a founder of Holgen Tech, and uh, I'm blessed or cursed by a love of biology and mathematics, which is a very bizarre combination, but not here. I'd like to congratulate all of you because this is a fantastic situation we have now. Probably this is why we are sitting in a breakthrough prize room, because something like this happened already when the atom split. And people were mesmerized. It was not, it was not supposed to split. There was no theory, no quantum mechanics. You know, nothing applied. And now, and then they later learned that if it splits or if it's fused, fantastic amounts of energy can be released. So it's extremely important. Now we know that we can edit the genome, but we don't understand the genome. So let me point out that the genome actually is fractal. So nonlinear dynamics applies to it. Yeah. So there is a little bit of adjustment about this volume knob. <laughs> it's not quite linear. We have to build that kind of mathematics of biology of the genome and also of the brain because it is a mixed system. For instance, the cerebellum, which coordinates motor uh, activities in the space-time domain linearly. Just ask a policeman. The test is to act, actually proceed in a straight line. Without the cerebellum, you can't do that. But the main cells are fractals, Purkinje cells. So this, I don't know how many years from now, all this will come together to create that kind of new science, which will be deeply mathematical, deeply physical, and biological. It will take a little while, not because we are not as smart as, as Einstein, perhaps, but the problem is a whole lot more difficult. Does anyone else have a question? Um, so, oh, uh, I'm Xiaoliang Qi from uh, Stanford University. I'm a kind of matter physicist. So it's, it's really great uh, to see that like, all the three very different topics are related to complexity in some sense. Uh, so I have a question to Masej. Uh, uh, I'm a physicist, so I, I want. I'm, so so um, I wonder, like like you show, there are these tools like gamma, uh, like the zeta function, uh, which are used to describe um, uh, chaos. So so uh, I think if I study a different system, different dynamical system, then uh, I use a different function. But if I look at the ensemble of all the different dynamical systems, then is there a sense that like complexity is bounded, or like how complicated it can be, or how, how fast can chaos grow? Well, I, I'm afraid I, I don't know an answer to this question, so I would have to speculate, and I, I would rather not, since it's all recorded. <laughs> you know, so. But we can maybe talk in private, you know. I'm, I'm Tom Klein. I'm a biologist. I just wanted one question. Uh, talk about quantum gravity. Am I correct in interpreting then there's a minimum amount of distortion of space time? Would that be is that what quantum gravity tells me, or is it some, or is that just a word you use that? That is, I'm trying to equate qu quanta that you you know the discrete limits to what I guess mass could be. In that way, does it apply to gravity, that there's a, a minimum distortion? Yeah, uh, that's, one, that's one aspect of quantum gravity which in some situations is already understood. So, uh, for example, you may have heard that black holes are believed to evaporate. They emit radiation and they, um, and they, and they get smaller. And you can think of that as coming from the fact that the gravitational field cannot be completely determinate. Um, on the, you know, if, if, if you, if you, just as when you have a particle and you know that it's in a certain region, then it must have a certain minimum momentum. Similar things are true about, about the gravitational field. So you, you can't just assume that it's completely known in the sort of classical sense. It has to, it has to fluctuate a, a little bit. What we're uh, struggling with is, so, you know, so you can treat situations like this um, by, by patching together 
gravity and quantum mechanics um, in in a sort of incomplete way, and it's good enough. But but there are more interesting questions we'd like to answer, like what happens when you jump into that black hole, uh, or what happens if you if you let the film run backwards and the universe is getting denser and denser and seemingly approaching a point of infinite density. Um, what happens there? And that patchwork quantum gravity isn't good enough to answer those questions. Right, let's take one last question. Bruce Ames, I'm a biologist. Uh, a few years ago, uh, string theory was the hot thing. Did that go anywhere, or are people now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Ed, Ed Whitten is in the audience. Uh, <laughs> string theory has been, always will be the hot thing. Uh, 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 it's <laughs> that was funny. Uh, so, so I mean, string theory is string theory is what I meant when I said that we have uh, a complete quantum theory of gravity for a certain class of universes. Um, I have no doubt that that theory is correct for that class of universes, and we have a lot more than that from string theory as well. Uh, but it is indeed, you know, challenge has been a challenge, um, perhaps precisely because string theory is always dealt with with extremely well-defined objects. It's been a challenge to get it to tell us stuff about our own universe, and and about these sort of dirty situations when. You're not you know, far away from where the action is, and you just smash things together and watch them come back out again. That's what we do at a particle collider. Um, here, we're sort of inside looking out. And it may be that you know, my, my, my own viewpoint is that we, we should pursue all paths. So we should look at what we can learn from string theory, which is definitely by far the, you know, the richest concrete theory of quantum gravity that's out there. Um, I would say pretty much the only one. Um, but, but at the same time, I think we shouldn't neglect the sort of old-fashioned way of doing physics where you, you look at funny stuff that you can discern in the theories you already have, and you say, wait, that has to have a deeper explanation. Let's go look for that. I think many, we need both. Are many people working in your area? Uh, that depends on the definition of, of your area. Um, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> there are certainly you know, thousands of people working on string theory. Um, there are probably a lot fewer uh, working on these questions of, of understanding the connection between uh, entropy and, and, uh, and or information and geometry. Uh, many of them are string theorists, uh, some of the very best ones. <laughs> OK. Um, so when we were preparing for this session, um, various of us brought up you know, that we, we really need to anchor this with a joke that starts with a mathematician, a biologist, and a <laughs> physicist walk into a bar. And I regret to inform you that we never actually managed to formulate this joke. Um, but I'm hoping that stimulated by the conversation we have just had, that um, we will continue this next year and perhaps we will have managed to come up with a joke by then. So join me in thanking all of the speakers for really putting themselves out there. Thank you.